Good evening. Praise be Jesus Christ. Welcome to our first catechism live stream from St. Joan of Arc. Uh, so we're going to cover tonight a bit about the seven sacraments, how they are presented in uh, St. John's Gospel, and uh, a little bit about each sacrament, and uh, some really neat things how St. John really uses the miracles that our Lord does to highlight those seven sacraments. So I'm actually relying a lot on the work of uh, Dr. John Bergsma, who uh, kind of pointed out some of these, uh, these things. Uh, but I'm also relying on our handy-dandy Catechism of the Council of Trent. And so we're going to be referencing that and, uh, as well as sacred scripture. So let's dive right in. So in St. John's Gospel, he describes only seven miracles that our Lord does. He does... Uh, a number of miracles, but St. John only talks about seven of them. And each of these seven miracles, St. John calls signs. He uses that particular term, the signs. So a sign, of course, points to something else, points to a spiritual reality. And St. John is, uh, in the opinion of Dr. John Bergsman, I think he makes a good case for it, he's really trying to point to the seven sacraments by pointing out these particular seven signs. So we're going to go through those, um, and then we'll, we'll talk about how those are pointed out in uh, St. John's uh, Gospel. So let's dive right in. So the first sacrament, sacrament of baptism. So the sacrament of baptism is uh, necessary for our salvation. Uh, it is the uh, sacrament of the new law, uh, whereby... Um, Water is poured upon the person baptized, and the person is washed clean of original sin. There are five effects from the sacrament of baptism. The first effect is the remission of sin, so our sins taken away. The second is the remission of all the punishment due to sin. So even if a person has committed personal sin, uh, in addition to having original sin on his soul, then he also has the punishment of that sin taken away. Then the third effect is the grace of regeneration, being born again. That's actually what baptism uh, is, is being born again. Uh, we can see that in John chapter uh, 3, verse 5, and also in Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Then there's the fourth effect of baptism, and that is the infused virtues are given to us, and we're also incorporated into Christ. That's how we're made members of the church through baptism. That's the fourth effect. And then finally, the fifth effect is the, the character, the indelible mark put on our soul. Now, um, in this, uh, this sacrament in St. John's Gospel, he describes uh, the healing, he describes the sacrament kind of through the miracle of the, the healing of the man who was born blind. So that is in John chapter 9, uh, verse 1 through 41. So in John 9, 1 through 41, if you have your Bibles back at home, you can take a look at uh, this, and I'm going to reference it a couple of times. So this is that, that miracle where our Lord uh, cures this man, and St. John points out very particular things that, that point out some things that which are actually going to teach us something about baptism. They asked at the beginning, did this man sin, or were it, was it his parents that he was born blind? And our, our Lord says, no, neither, okay? So he's just inherited this condition, kind of like we inherit the condition of original sin. That original sin leaves us in blindness, right? And so this man is also blind, right? So then um, our Lord uh, goes up to the man. Um, he, uh, he says, uh, I, you know, I am the light of the world. This is in John chapter 9, verse 5. Uh, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and spread the clay upon his eyes. Now, whenever we've heard this gospel read, we think it's such a strange thing. Here our Lord spits on the ground. It seems very unbecoming of him to do this. He takes, uh, he takes this, this dust, right, which is now formed into clay because of his spittle, and he uses that to anoint the man's eyes, and then he has him go wash in the pool of Siloam, and then the man is healed of his blindness, right? And then afterwards, the people see him, and they say, oh, is this the man who was begging here before, the blind man? And he says, no, it's only like him, right? And then he says, the, the man responds, he says, um, uh, he responds rather ambiguously. Um, but first, before we get to that point, I want to focus on the, the, the spittle and the clay that our Lord makes. So when our Lord spits on the ground and makes this clay, He's actually evoking creation imagery. 
because man, Adam, was made out of the dust of the earth. Okay, so uh, how's dust held together? You, you can't form a man out of dust. So there's actually a Jewish tradition, a rabbinic tradition, that God spat on the ground, and from that divine spittle and the dust of the earth, he formed the clay, which he used to make Adam. Now, we don't actually believe that, you know, God has this divine spittle or something, but it's just a way of thinking about it, and it's a way that the Jews used to express this. So our Lord, by spitting on the ground and making this clay, he's kind of saying that he is like uh, this new creation. He's, he's, he is performing a divine act. He's uh, hearkening back to that uh, act of creation of Adam. And then he has him wash. So first he anoints his eyes, and that anointing reminds us of the anointing at baptism, right? We are anointed also at baptism. And then we are washed with water. And just like this man, his eyes were washed with water, and he comes out uh, able to see, right? Now, I want to point out this detail, which um, it seems to be an odd mention. You know, why does St. John include this detail where the neighbors, therefore, this is in uh, verse 8, the neighbors, when they saw the man, they said, isn't this he who sat and begged? And then the others said, no, but he's like him. And then the man responds. Now, I'm going to read it just as it is in the, in the Greek. So in, he says, the man responded, and he said, I am. He didn't say, I am he, like your Dewey Rames will say, I am he, but the Greek says, ego emi, to us I of uh, that name of God, which was given in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when God said to Moses, he gave him the name of God, he said, you know, who is your, what is your name? And God said, I am is my name, right? He is, God is he who exists of himself, he doesn't exist because of anyone else. He simply is, so he's, he's alone. he alone can say, I am, I simply exist. But here, this man says this, the blind man who was just healed. They ask him, Are, is this the blind man, or is it someone else? And he says, I am. Now, that's an ambiguous response, right? I am. So does that, does that mean you're the same person, or are you someone else? He just says, I am. But it's really like that in, in this way, uh, that response is pretty good. I am, right? And that's why uh, St. John mentions this. Okay, and notice also um, it wasn't because of his fault. You know, he wasn't blind because of his own fault. It was something he inherited just like that state of original sin. Okay, so that's, that's the first sacrament. So then in the, the next sacrament that we're going to encounter is the sacrament of confirmation. So in the Sacrament of Confirmation, um, we have that, that sacrament whereby um, we, we have uh, this, this healing that takes place, you know, we are, or strengthening, rather, of our soul that takes place, right? Confirmation is that sacrament of the new law by which, with the anointing of the sacred chrism and the prayer of the bishop, a person becomes stronger, right, to become a perfect soldier of Christ. So that's that Sacrament of Confirmation. Um, which is the sign, which is the miracle in uh, St. John's Gospel that corresponds to that? That's found in John chapter 5, uh, verse 1 through 18, uh, the healing of the man at Bethesda, okay? So the healing of the man at Bethesda takes place, um, this is that man who was lying at the pool of the water, right? He's waiting, you know, there's a special miracle that would take place where uh, the waters would be stirred, and whoever reached, went to the waters there first, whoever got to the waters first, would be healed, right? So the Spirit would come down, right? A little, you know, hint of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, coming down and stirring the waters, right? And then whoever went there uh, received that healing. And this man was lying there for 38 years. Our Lord says, do you want to be healed? And the man says, you know, I have no one to carry me in there. He didn't have the strength to carry himself there, okay? He was alive. He was spiritually alive, as it were. Um, you know, he wasn't like someone dead, but uh, he just didn't have the strength to, to do this, to, to make himself, um, to, to get down there to reach that place where, uh, where the Spirit, right, this, this uh, stirring, divine stirring of the waters would take place. And so after this, when he's healed, the people say, yeah, you can't take up your, you're carrying your, your, your bed, right? Our Lord said, go, you know, take up your pallet and walk. The man was healed. 
And so when the Jews saw this, it was the Sabbath, and they said, you can't be carrying that on the Sabbath. And he said, well, the man who healed me said to do that. And then when they, uh, when he said, well, who is it? And he said, I, he couldn't find him. He didn't know who it was. And when our Lord found him in the temple again, he said, you know, go and sin no more. And then the man went back and told the Jews, it was Jesus who healed me, right? So after this, after his healing, the man gives witness to Christ. So in this way, uh, this man is now a soldier of Christ. He's giving witness to Christ. So in, in uh, this, this uh, sacrament, or this miracle, has a connection to that sacrament of uh, confirmation. You know, one of the effects of the sacrament is an uh, increase of, uh, of strength, right? This man didn't have the strength before to go to the waters, right? As I said, he was not like a man dead, but he just wasn't strong enough, right? And so in the same way we're baptized, we don't have the strength. We're, we, we need an augmentation, an increase of our strength in order to become good soldiers of Christ. We're also given an increase in grace at the Sacrament of Confirmation, as the Council of Trent says, and we're also given that character on our soul, a permanent mark on our soul. This is another one of those sacraments that can't be repeated once it's been received, uh, because it puts a permanent mark on the soul, and it makes that soul a soldier of Christ. So the man witnesses to Christ afterwards. He now has the strength to carry his, his pallet and walk, to carry his own cross. And so in this way, this uh, sacrament, this healing corresponds to uh, the sacrament of confirmation. All right, let's move on to the next, uh, the next sacrament. So the next one we're going to cover is the sacrament of penance. So the sacrament of penance, as we know, um, is given to us for the healing of sins committed after baptism. Now, um, you know, penance has several meanings, right? So there, there's uh, repentance, right? Or, you know, I, I repent of doing something. Now there's kind of an earthly meaning, and that, that's not the one we're talking about here, like, oh, I repent, I regret doing this thing. I'm sorry for doing this thing. That's not the kind of sorrow, that's not the kind of penance we're talking about in this sacrament. Penance also has, it's also that term penance, is also used uh, to express the sorrow that a sinner conceives, not, however, for the sake of God, but for his own sake, right? So maybe he has this agitation of mind because of past sins he's committed, but he's really sorry for himself, right? That's, this is incomplete um, and faulty uh, penance. Um, it's, it's really sort of for his own sake, um, and this is definitely not a, not a perfect uh, penance. But then finally, then the penance that we're talking about in this sacrament is that penance which moves the interior um, to give uh, uh, repentance, you know, to, uh, turning away from the sin. It comes from a Greek word, penitemini. That's where we get penance from. It's from the Greek penitemini, which means to turn away. You turn away from a sin that you had before. So uh, penance is that by which we experience interior sorrow of heart, or we give some uh, exterior indication of that sorrow for the sake of God. That's the key thing with this third form of penance. It's this kind of sorrow that the word uh, repentance or penance uh, properly applies to. Okay? So interior penance, the, the penance that we want to have in the sacrament, consists in turning to God sincerely from the heart, and in hating and detesting the sins we've committed, and having the firm resolution of amendment of life, whilst also we have the hope of gaining pardon through the mercy of Almighty God. Okay, so um, that's that sacrament as the Council of Trent describes it. Um, let's look at the miracle, the sign, uh, in St. John's Gospel that corresponds to that. And that we find in John chapter 11. So in John chapter 11, verse 1 through 45, now we have that, that third sacrament. So John chapter 11, uh, 1 through 45. So in this uh, long chapter, right, he devotes a whole chapter to this one sign, this one miracle. John chapter 11, 1 through 45. Here is the healing of Lazarus, right? So here Lazarus is... Um, is, has, is dead, right? He was, um, y you know, when, when our Lord shows up, they said he's already been in the tomb for four days. So he, he's dead. Uh, now, the Jews then um, uh, realize that uh, this is hopeless, right? Uh, he, he, he's he's uh, deceased. He can't be uh, healed. Um, but our Lord says, no, it's, it's not for his, um, you know, this, this sickness is not unto death. 
spiritual death. It is for the glory of God. So our Lord um, raises the man uh, to life. And when he does this, I want to make note that it was done after he was dead for four days. Now remember, um, using the chronology in sacred scripture, the world, since the, the time of Adam, as the genealogies give it, uh, since the genealogy of Adam, that's 4,000 years, okay? Now, St. Peter says that a 1,000 years is, is as a day, a day is as a 1,000 years, right? And we're talking about the, using the genealogies from sacred scripture, uh, 4,000 years of genealogies. So uh, a 1,000 years is as a day, a day is as a 1,000 years in sacred scripture. And so this 4,000 years is like four days. Lazarus has been in the tomb for four days, so in a certain sense, then, Lazarus represents all of the genealogy of mankind, all of mankind, as it has been lying in the tomb for four days, for 4,000 years, since the time of Adam. So Lazarus, then, in, dead in the tomb for those four days, represents um, all of mankind, kind of dead uh, for uh, all of uh, mankind's history. So then uh, Lazarus is called forth from the dead, and so here... In doing so, once he's called forth, um, and then he says, unbind him, right? So he's still wrapped up in these, in these uh, cloths, right? So in this uh, calling forth of Lazarus from the dead, it's hearkening to that sacrament of penance, right? So um, a soul that is dead in mortal sin needs to be brought back to life. And so it needs to be brought back to life by the word of the Lord. And so it's by the word of the Lord, the calling forth of this man back to life, a miracle takes place. And so Lazarus is called back to life, just like a soul in mortal sin is called back to life in uh, the sacrament of penance, also by the word of the Lord given through the priest in the moment of absolution. But notice that Lazarus comes out and he's still bound up. He's still bound up in these cloths. You know, our Lord says, unbind him, right? So he still needs help to be unbound because we come forth from sin. We come forth, um, we were uh, forgiven of our sins. And, uh, well, we might have some habits, though. You know, we've developed some natural habits. We might be free from that sin. We're alive again. But we might have some bad habits that we need to be unbound from, right? So that's an important part uh, that follows upon reception of the sacrament of penance, is to be unbound from those bad habits. That's the amendment of life that's necessary. Um, so I think we can see then from the uh, bringing forth of Lazarus from, from the tomb, um, a little hint, a little uh, symbol of that sacrament of uh, penance. So let's move on to the next sacrament. Sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. Now, this one's pretty easy to see. Uh, that's the next sign that we see. Um, and we see this in John chapter 6, verse 30, where um, the Jews ask him straight out, what sign do you perform that we may believe thee? Right? And so our Lord had just multiplied the loaves. Right? So he had just multiplied the loaves at the beginning of John chapter 6. They followed him over the Red Sea, uh, or not the Red Sea, they, they followed him around the, the Sea of Tiberias, and so they wanted to meet him because they had just been fed by the, by the loaves, they, were, they saw this miracle, and so they want to make him king. But our Lord um, uh, points out, he says, you've, you're just following me because you've had your, your fill of the bread. He says, but don't hunger after that bread, hunger after the true bread, right, the bread of life. And so when our Lord describes himself, as the bread of life, um, then you know we, we see uh, we see their response. So I think we can see here this this sign, this miracle of the multiplication of the loaves, is going to correspond to the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist, in which our Lord gives Himself to us as the true bread of life, His true body, blood, soul, and divinity, um, given under this appearance of bread. Um, just want to note uh, a couple of things here. Um, you remember where our Lord uh, says, "I am the bread of life." Uh, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. That's John chapter 6, verse 52. And so there uh, our Lord is uh, saying that he is the living bread. He's giving us the bread of life. And he says what that bread is. And this is a key apologetics point. So now we're going to put on an apologetics hat and go into this point. Uh, it's important for us to note that our Lord explains what he means. You know, sometimes you'll get some Protestants that say, 
this is a symbol, right? He's only speaking symbolically, right? But he says what this actually means, what the bread is. He doesn't say the bread is, is belief in me. He doesn't say the bread is uh, trusting in my word, or it's my word that I give you. He explains what he, what he means in John 6, 52. He says, the bread that I will give is my flesh. That's what it is, right? People will say, well, if he's speaking symbolically, you know, that is maybe speaking symbolically. The problem with that is we have to interpret it. If we're going to look at it symbolically, we'd have to interpret it according to how sacred scripture takes any expression of, you know, the, the flesh, eating the flesh as being symbolic. Um, there's, a, there's an example, um, I think it's um, Isaiah chapter 9, I'd have to look it up, but I think it's Isaiah chapter 9. There, uh, it's said that, um, eat, you know, the man, one man shall eat the flesh of his, of his arm, you know, and what they're really saying there, that's speaking symbolically because they're talking about one tribe against another, and they'll like, you know, eat them up and, you know, chew them up and spit them out. So if we're going to take it as symbolically, it's a symbolic expression, eat the flesh of someone, we would have to take that as Scripture takes it, which in Scripture, whenever you use that expression symbolically, it's a bad thing. It's not a good thing. And our Lord says, you must eat my flesh. So he must not be speaking symbolically because it, when it's used symbolically in Scripture, it's a bad thing, like I'm going to chew you up or I'm going to chew you out. You know, that's symbolic of, you know, uh, bad talking to someone, right? Uh, so our Lord is not speaking symbolically. He's really giving us his flesh. Um, now, I want to point out something that, um, that, w- that is often um, pointed out by Protestants, and th- they will say um, in verse 64, where he, where he says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. This is a key point. There's a huge difference between the flesh and my flesh. Our Lord says the flesh profits nothing. But there's a big difference between the flesh. He's just talking about, you know, the flesh having a uh, sort of carnal mindset, carnal desires, right? pampering our flesh. The flesh profits nothing. There's a big difference between that and my flesh. You know, as uh, uh, Dr. Bergsma points out, he says, would any one of us want to go up to our Lord and say, your flesh, it profits nothing. That flesh which you gave for my salvation, it profits nothing. So in that verse where he says the flesh profits nothing, he's not talking about his flesh. He's talking about the flesh, the spirit of the flesh, people who live by the flesh. That profits nothing, right? So at any rate, we'll take the apologetics hat off and we'll get back to uh, catechism here. Uh, So there we can see in this reference to uh, the Holy Eucharist in John chapter 6, verse 1 through 60, uh, the multiplication of the loaves, uh, a reference to uh, the sacrament of the Holy Eucharist. So let's move on to the next sacrament, extreme unction. So um, extreme unction, this one, we see this sacrament um, symbolized by the healing of the ruler's son in John chapter 4, uh, verse 46 through 54, the healing of the ruler's son. This happened at Capernaum, and so uh, in this episode, uh, here there's a man who is near the point of death. The ruler's son is near the, the point of death, and our Lord says to them, when they, come, when they came to our Lord, um, you know, he, you know he, heal, this, he, heal my son, our Lord says, Unless you see signs and wonders, unless you see signs and wonders, you believe not. John chapter 4, verse 48. So um, here again, he's going to do a sign. He's going to do a sign. Remember, a sign points to something, and in this case, this sign, this healing, is pointing uh, to another sacrament. Here, uh, our Lord heals this man. Uh, He is uh, on the point of death. Uh, Not dead yet, right? The ruler's son. Uh, he wants to be healed, and he was sick. The Lord heals. He goes down. Um, he just says the word, go thy way, thy son lives, right? And the man believed the word. He went his way, and at that moment that the word went out from the Lord, the man was actually healed. So this corresponds to that person who is on the point of death, received a word of healing from our Lord, 
corresponds to the sacrament of extreme unction, okay, which is given when someone is on the point of death and dangerously sick um, and then receives that uh, sacrament. So the sacrament is administered uh, not only for the uh, spiritual grace that it bestows, but also for the recovery of health, right? That's often uh, at times an effect of the sacrament. If you call the priest early enough, some people wait too late and the person's already morphined out of his mind and, you know, it's, it's a bit hard at that point to get the person back, right? They're already, they're at the point of death there. But uh, extreme unction then uh, can be administered um, as the Catechism of the Council of Trent says, uh, it can be administered to no one who is not dangerously sick, okay? So he says, not even those who are in danger of death as when they're on a dangerous voyage, like, you know, Father, I'm going on a dangerous trip, dangerous mission, or I'm going into battle, can I receive extreme unction? Or even those that say, you know, um, I'm condemned to death, right? So someone in, in a prison might be condemned to death. Well, as long as that person doesn't have the danger of death already in his body, he can't receive that sacrament yet. Sometimes um, even just the simple fact, just the simple fact of just going into surgery, all right? So just sim the simple fact of just receiving a surgery, like an elective surgery, that alone doesn't warrant the reception of the sacrament of extreme unction. However, if the reason for the surgery is a real danger of death, that uh, is already in the physical condition of the person, then that sacrament can indeed be administered, okay? We see the sacrament described in James chapter 5, verse 14 through 16 um, in the New Testament, but also uh, in, with this healing of the ruler's son, we see a little echoing back to uh, the sacrament of extreme unction in uh, John chapter 46, um, or chapter 4, verse 46 and following. Because uh, here the man was at the point of death, our Lord heals him, he's brought back, okay? So that's, uh, that, that's this, uh, this sacrament. So now uh, we'll move on to uh, the next sign that is shown in St. John's Gospel that points to one of the sacraments. And this is actually found in a couple of places, and I'll, I'll show you how it's in two places. Um, this, is, um, this is where our Lord... Um, dies and rises again. That's, the, that's the, the sign of this following sacrament. Um, because you remember when our Lord went in, he cleansed the temple, he drove the money changers out. Um, it was the gospel for today. And um, our Lord um, you know, overturned the tables of the money changers, the chairs of those who sold doves, drove the cattle out of there, told the people who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. And so when he does all these things, the Jews ask him, the priests ask him, what sign dost thou show unto us, seeing that thou dost these things? John chapter 2, verse 18. And here our Lord says in response, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And of course, the temple he's speaking of is the temple of his body. So he's already saying that the sign that I'm going to give you, because they asked him, what sign dost thou show us? He says, the sign that I will give you is the raising up of the temple of his body. And so uh, what sacrament is this pointing to? Well, in order to really get the, the sense of what sacrament that's pointing to, we have to go to that other place where this sign is completed, and this is in John chapter 20, but also John chapter 19 is going to shed some light on it too. In John chapter 19, we see what's going on with the death and the uh, resurrection. Because keep in mind, the sign he gives is destroy the temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So the sign is both the death and the resurrection of our Lord. And so in the crucifixion of our Lord, um, we see a couple of details given. Remember, our Lord was stripped of his garments and that uh, linen tunic that he was wearing. A linen tunic is something that the priests would wear. Um, and it was also as John chapter 19, verse 23 says, it was without seam. So it was woven without seam. This actually gives us a, um, uh, a little hint of what is going on here because there's, an, there's only one other garment that we know was uh, in the sacred scripture that was woven without seam, and that's given in Exodus 28, and that's the garment of the high priest. The garment of the high priest is woven without seam, Exodus 28, verse 31 through 32. 
And so our Lord, by having this garment there at the place of offering, the place of sacrifice uh, on Mount Calvary, is kind of showing that he is a, uh, a high priest, right? So he is both the priest and the victim. He's the one doing the offering, right? He says, no man lays down my life, but I lay it down freely. And he is also the victim, right? He is called the Lamb of God, as St. John uh, the Baptist called him in um, uh, John chapter 2. Uh, you know, here's the Lamb of God. And so our Lord being a lamb, well, Jews knew what lambs were for. They knew that those were meant for sacrifice. And so uh, this, uh, this sign then, point, the, the death and the resurrection of our blessed Lord, is pointing to his priestly office, his uh, priestly status, his role as priest and victim. And so this sign of the death and resurrection of our Lord, which our Lord himself says is a sign, is uh, pointing towards and kind of harkens back towards the sacrament of holy orders. Now, in the Council of Trent, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, it says that the power that is given in holy orders is twofold. It's the power of orders and the power of jurisdiction. So there's a power to confect sacraments, but then there's also a power uh, to govern. So first of all, the power of orders has for its object the real body of Christ our Lord in the Blessed Eucharist. Then there's the power of jurisdiction, and that refers to the mystical body of Christ. Okay, And so uh, the scope of this power is to govern and rule the Christian people and lead them to the uh, unending bliss of heaven. Right. So um, uh, the Catechism of the Council of Trent says that you know, a person shouldn't you know, rush into this office. Um, this office shouldn't be rashly imposed upon anyone, but it's to be conferred on people who have holiness of life, uh, their knowledge, faith, and prudence, right? Um, so that's kind of what goes on in seminaries. The, uh, the people at the seminary discern, does this guy have the holiness of life? Does this guy, uh, you know, have the prudence, uh, the faith uh, to bear this, this office, right? So that's always going to be a part of one's discernment. Um, but at any rate, the fact that um, our Lord, who offers himself on, uh, on the cross, um, uh, as he says, as the Lamb of God, the Lamb of sacrifice, um, you know, with that uh, priestly tunic, that linen garment that was woven without seam, just as the high priest was, this, uh, this sign of the death and the resurrection of our Lord uh, points to his, um, his priestly role. Uh, also, the fact that uh, his resurrection, it's, it's actually pointed to in the priestly offerings themselves. You know, when the priests would uh, make the sacrifices, when they would, um, uh, you know, kill the, the lambs, the cattle, then they would divide them up. They would basically butcher the animal, but then they would reassemble the animal on the altar itself with the fire there consuming the animal. What this points to then is the resurrection, because yes, the animal is killed in sacrifice, but then it's reassembled on the altar, and so it's actually laid out on the altar in sort of the same arrangement that it had in, while it was alive. And so it's, it's a, a little hint of the resurrection. And so that's why when uh, our Lord is saying both the, the destruction of his body and the, the restoration of his body, the resurrection of his body, it, it, it really brings to the Jewish mind back uh, to that, um, that priestly office, right? because that's what the priests would do. They would kill the animal, cut it up, and then reassemble it in a certain sense, resurrect it. But this time, resurrect it to be consumed in the flames of the altar, and that consumption in the flames of the altar is uh, a sign of God's accepting and filling that creature with the, the power and the, the love of the Holy Ghost. The fire is a symbol of the, the love of God, right, and the Holy Ghost. And so by reassembling that, uh, that animal on the altar and burning it on the altar, it's uh, kind of saying that you're going to be created anew in the love of the Holy Ghost. That's what's going on, and then that will be taken up, and that's why the, the smoke ascends to heaven. It's uh, a sign of uh, that you know, being uh, um, born, created an, again, born again, uh, reconstituted, and uh, reformed, uh, you know, formed as a new man in God. We are, um, we are made a, a new creature. Uh, spiritual uh, creature, as it were. Okay, so um, next we want to take a look at 
that last sacrament. By the way, if you if you want to uh, type in any questions, uh, you're free to send in questions on uh, Facebook, and uh, we can get those answered for you as we as we continue going. Okay, we got one last sign to look at. Uh, then we can look at uh, some of those questions or um, just fill in any gaps that we might have uh, had here. So the last sign is the one that's, uh, the, one, the one that's missing. Is, it's the one mentioned in um, St. John's Gospel. It's only in St. John's Gospel where, where this sign is mentioned. And this is the sign that takes place with the changing of the water into wine at the wedding feast at Cana. This is John chapter 2, verse 1 through 11. And um, we, we look at that. So, uh, you know, that chapter starts where it says, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. So third day, all of a sudden we're talking about third day. We're counting days here. But it's actually not all of a sudden because we start going back and we say, Well, what's, you know, it's the third day from what? What reference point, Right. As we go back, we we can see um, we can see there's uh, there's there's a whole story that's beginning at the very beginning of uh, Saint John's Gospel. So first, we're going to start then at John chapter one verse one, where he says, "In the beginning was the Word." Now the Jews knew how another book of sacred scripture began with that very same expression, "In the beginning." That's how the book of Genesis begins. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And that happened on the first day, right? The first day of creation. So um, we have all these things that are happening um, uh, on the, the first day. Uh, you know, it speaks about, you know, Christ is the true light. And this is the, the last gospel that we read every day at Holy Mass, right? Uh, all things were made by him, and him was life. The life was the light of men. Um, in verse 9, this is John, John chapter 1, verse 9. He was the true light, which enlightens every man that comes into the world, right? And then it talks about, if we look in, um, uh, look a little further down, it says, uh, look at, I'm sorry, verse 5, John chapter 1, verse 5, um, the light shines in the darkness, the darkness did not comprehend it. So here we have the imagery of light and darkness. This is what's being described in day one, because it's in the beginning, on day one of creation, that God created light, right? So they're here. We have, um, we have uh, this, uh, you know, sort of creation imagery that's being described in the first chapter of St. John's Gospel. What he's then saying is Christ is establishing, he's creating, he's, he's making a new creation, right? And so that's day one kind of uh, information, right? Then, take a look at John, if you have your Bibles out. Take a look at John at chapter 1, verse 29, the next day, notice now, you see here's, we're going into day two here. The next day, John saw Jesus coming to him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, All right? And so, um, you know, okay, so now we're, we're talking about another day of, uh, of creation. Then just going down a few more verses, verse 35, the next day again, John stood and saw two of his disciples, right? coming, and so he begins to call the disciples, and that's where uh, John says, Behold the Lamb of God. John chapter 1, verse 36, Behold the Lamb of God, right? And then um, we see, uh, uh, so there, now we're on to day three, right? And we had a couple of next days, so now we're on to day three. And then uh, look at verse 43, John chapter 1, verse 43, the following day, so now we're on to day four, if we're counting from the beginning, the following day, he would go forth into Galilee. He found Philip, who said, come and follow me, right? And then Nathaniel's called, etc. And then the chapter ends, and now we begin with that wedding feast of Cana here. And the third day, well, the third day from what? It's the third day from the last day we mentioned. We were already on the fourth day, so the third day from that is the seventh day. So we're talking about a Sabbath day. We're talking about uh, an eternal day. So in the creation of the world, which took six days, that number corresponds to the world, right? The number six then corresponds to this world. The number seven corresponds to the next world, right? That's the number of the covenant with God. That's really what the number of seven 
number seven means. Some people say it's the number of completion. Really, in the Jewish mind, the number 10 is more the number of completion, but the number seven is the number of the covenant, the covenant with God. So the sixth day, because there were six days of creation, that number six corresponds to uh, this world, which is why, by the way, uh, the number of the beast is 666, because he's all about just living for this world, and he wants you to live only for this world. He wants you to pamper your flesh and take care of that only, right? Whereas uh, the seventh day, it's looking beyond that. That's why the seventh day points to the sun, right? The Sabbath day, the day of rest, the day of eternal rest, right? That's what that points to. So now this miracle taking place on, as it says, the third day, but the third day from that last day that was numbered, so this is really the seventh day from when we started counting. This miracle takes place on the seventh day. It's pointing towards a Sabbath principle, a covenant principle. Well, then Jesus was there at this uh, marriage, right? This marriage at Cana of Galilee. John chapter uh, 2, verse 1 through 11. And so, um, uh, remember, uh, he again, we see the number 6 show up where he, sa- he sets forth six water pots of stone. He has them b- filled up with water, and these are the ones changed into wine. So by changing uh, these six huge stone pots of water, he's providing great abundance, Right? You know, it was predicted in the Old Testament that when the Messiah comes, he will bring great abundance, great blessing, right? Just showering blessing. He, he does everything with great love, great largesse, you know. And so um, uh, by changing so much water into wine, he is um, uh, showing his, his tremendous power, but also he's showing uh, that he is um, performing a specific function. And what function is that? Well, when he changed the water into wine, what did ever, who, who did everyone think provided this? When the steward tasted the water made wine, who does he go to? He goes to the bridegroom of that wedding and says, you've provided, you waited till now to provide the good wine, right? Most people drink the, the, uh, most people at, you know, weddings, they'll provide the, the sort of, good wine first and then sort of the more nasty stuff later. He says, you've d- provided the good stuff now, or you, know, you waited to provide the good stuff uh, until now. So he goes to the bridegroom because it was the bridegroom's duty to provide the wine. So by our Lord providing the wine, he's saying he's providing, he's, he's fulfilling the role of a bridegroom. Okay, so in this sense, he's pointing towards marriage, right? Then uh, the first woman mentioned in the uh, Gospel of St. John is the mother of Jesus, right? In uh, chapter 2, verse 1, there was the marriage at Cana, and the mother of Jesus was there, right? So she's the first woman mentioned in the Gospel. She's like a new Eve, the first woman mentioned in Genesis. And so Our Lady is like a, a new Eve in this, And our Lord is like the bridegroom. So in this way, he's pointing to that sacrament of matrimony, right? Which takes a natural union of a man and woman and elevates it and puts that bond on a spiritual level. So that the union of the man and the woman becomes a mirror, an image of Christ's union with the church. Ephesians 5 verse 22 talks about this as well. And I want you to note something uh, right at the very beginning um, of, uh, I'm sorry, just at the end of this uh, exchange. Um, This is in verse 11. So this is John chapter 2, verse 11. It says, This beginning of miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. But, you know, that that translation, um, beginning of miracles, um, it's, it's not... It's not the best translation. Uh, That's because if you look at the Latin, it says, initium signorum, right? Um, Or in, um, in, as the the Greek puts it, um, it says this this, um, semeon, which is sign, right? Signorum is also a sign, right? In the Latin, it's signorum. I can write that on there. On the board for you. Beginning of miracles in the Latin, it says, Initium Signorum. Okay. And then uh, the way the Greek has it is 
on um, semi on and this what this means is seniorum right Be this beginning of signs so again this miracle that means signs in greek semeon signs or in latin seniorum um, that is saying this is uh this is a sign of something else it's pointing to something else so this miracle is pointing towards christ being the bridegroom it's pointing towards this sacrament of matrimony okay so there's a there's a few uh a few things to to consider then so it's really neat these are the only seven miracles that saint john um describes in his gospel so what we start to realize then is um this uh this book and, and this gospel um, especially the highlights of the gospel as far as the miracles go, some of which have whole chapters devoted to these miracles, they're actually, uh, this, this gospel and these signs are actually about the sacraments of the church. So St. John is writing his gospel, and a central part of the gospel is these signs that, which point towards the sacraments of the Holy Catholic Church. So the greatest gospel, the gospel that soars above the others, um, you know, from this uh, this. Uh, great book uh, that we know as the Bible. This gospel is really a book about the sacraments of the Catholic Church. So uh, again, this is, this is our book, right? This is a book that belongs to the Catholic Church, and so we don't want to let others hijack it and sort of uh, take, uh, take the thought away uh, from us, right? So um, let's see, do we have any, any questions here? So, okay, we got a couple of questions. Okay. So, what motivated the Jews to reassemble the sacrifice while it's burning? Why would they do that? Okay, so um, the reason for that, they're talking about reassembling the, the sacrifice uh, on the altar. Um, it was that sign, I think I ex might have explained it, uh, that the fact that the, uh, it's not just about killing the lambs, you know, sometimes we get caught up on like, oh no, they're killing these lambs, and what's God doing, and why, why, why do they have to kill so many lambs? The reassembling them on the altar is saying it's not about the killing of them, it's about the reconstituting them, the reassembling them, the resurrecting of these, making them a new creature by dying to self and then living a new life. By changing the substance of the thing, by burning it on the altar, it changes the substance such that it now is elevated, right? It's literally elevated by the, the fumes, the, you know, the smoke as it's consumed and offered up to God. It's elevated. It's, it's, it, its existence is lifted up. That's a symbol of its existence. Obviously, we don't believe that the lamb is elevated into some divine status, but that was just a symbol of what is going on. Uh, whenever those sacrifices were uh, reassembled on the altar? That was a good question. Um, and so in the same way, uh, we have that duty to, be, to die to ourself uh, so that we can be uh, remade in Christ's image, right? Okay. Other questions? So... Here's a question uh, that came in. Um, why, th why the church withholds the sacrament of the Eucharist from the faithful, which preserves the soul from spiritual death? Okay, so um, uh, I'm not sure if you're referring to a couple of things. So there's a couple of there's a couple of things. Um, why would the church withhold the sacrament of the Eucharist from the faithful, which preserves the soul from spiritual death? Well, um, you're probably talking about the times we're living in today and the, uh, the restrictions that we have today. I'm assuming that's what the question is, uh, is about. Um, so keep in mind, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas mentions um, one reason why one might abstain, even voluntarily, right, from the Holy Eucharist. Uh, 
One reason that St. Thomas gives is you know, for abstaining from, you know, withholding oneself from the Holy Eucharist, is that if one has lost an appreciation for uh, the sacrament, we're not saying that individually we believe that the, you know, the people at these parishes, or that's why uh, this, is, this is being done. Obviously, you know, in, the, in the world today, in this situation that we're in where everyone's afraid of the, this virus, um, the reason being is they're trying to preserve the health of the people, the life of the people, but... Um, but perhaps why you say, why is God allowing that might be a better focus, right? Because God could have, you know, had these bishops not, uh, make all, not, not, not make this decision, uh, worldwide, but he didn't, they, these bishops did make that decision. And, um, uh, you know, so I think the, uh, the reality, it could be that maybe there's been a lot of bad communions out there. Maybe there's been a lot of irreverence uh, offered to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, and perhaps, you know, like St. Thomas says, a curative for that when we start to lose reverence for the Blessed Sacrament, when we start to treat it as something that's of the everyday, when we start to um, act like it's not something that's really, really special. St. Thomas says one should refrain from receiving Holy Communion as a way to increase your longing for the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, something that's most important um, to receive, and by the way, spiritual authors say it's not so important to receive communion frequently, but it's most important to receive Holy Communion fervently. What is helpful to the soul to receive frequently, when done well, is the sacrament of penance. That has a healing effect on the soul. Sometimes people don't grow in holiness. Think about this. Before this imposition of, uh, you know, kind of suspension of masses here was imposed upon us, we were probably, the society, the, the age, the, the, uh, the times today, we probably had the most access to the Blessed Sacrament of any other century. Pope St. Pius X promulgated uh, frequent communion, encouraged frequent communion, uh, at, even communion at younger ages than was ever done before. Um, it was rare that you would have people that would receive every day. Well, now that's open to everyone. And so just before this was suspended, the public masses were suspended, um, we had the most access of all history to the Blessed Sacrament. So by the reasoning of simply just f receiving as often as possible frequently, we should all be saints right now. We should all be the best saints that there ever were in history. Why are we not the best saints? Why is it that we have weakness. Well, that's because we're not making good communions. We're not making fervent communions. And maybe God is trying to hit a reset button so people re-enkindle their longing for the most blessed sacrament. So that, that could be one reason why God has allowed it. So, um, good. Other questions? Let me see. Okay. Okay. Uh, something else to one final point on that. Uh, okay, why would Sunday? Here's another question. Why would Sunday be a uh, regular work day since Saturday was the Sabbath in the Old Testament? Very good question. Why would Sunday be a regular work day since Saturday was a Sabbath in the Old Testament? So, um, what we are saying uh, basically, so in other words, is I, I think the question is why is. Uh, um, you know, why, why do we shift? Why in the Old Testament there was the Sabbath on uh, Saturday, and then in the New Testament, now we have that as the day. It's not a work day, right? Um, so the reason why is because um, there is a new, there's a new covenant. It's actually foreshadowed in a couple of places. So one is in Leviticus 23, if I remember correctly, and it describes the uh, feast days, Uh, the feast days of the Jews, which also, by the way, there were seven feast days. Those also point towards the seven sacraments, but we don't have to, time to go into those now, but that could be a uh, topic for f further study. But in Leviticus 23, um, it speaks about um, a new feast day that would be instituted, in verse 11, the next day after the Sabbath. So the next day after the Sabbath, right? Um, this is actually the, fe the feast of the first fruits. This is uh, Leviticus 23, verse 11. The priest takes the first fruits of the harvest and lifts it up. So we, gotta gr we have 
wheat being offered, right? A foreshadow of the Blessed Sacrament. He makes the sign of the cross. They called it a wave offering because it looks like he was waving it, and he makes the sign of the cross with this. He didn't realize he was making the sign of the cross back in the Old Testament. They didn't know what the cross was or was going to be. But this is done the next day after the Sabbath, right? And then that's the feast of the first fruits. And then another 50 days passes, and then again, the morrow after the Sabbath, 50 days, there's Pentecost, right? That's another feast. And it says on verse 16, um, that is 50 days after that, uh, the day of the Sabbath, you shall offer a new sacrifice to the Lord. So again, there's the 50 days pass, and it's the day after the Sabbath, there shall be a new sacrifice to the Lord. So it's foreshadowing this new sacrifice to the Lord that will be offered in the new covenant that's offered on the day after the Sabbath, the day after Saturday, on Sunday. There's also um, a fulfillment of that, or a reference to that, in Hebrews, in the book of uh, Hebrews, uh, chapter 4. So in Hebrews 4, we see something. This would be a good one to uh, show your uh, your associates who are Je- uh, Jehovah's Witnesses or Seventh-day Adventists, because they still, they still have their day as Saturday, right? But um, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 4, um, God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And then jumping down to verse 8, it says, well, they didn't get that rest. They didn't enter into rest in the old covenant. And then it says in verse 8, This is, again, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, he would never have afterwards spoken of another day. Another day besides the day of the old covenant Sabbath. And then it says in verse 9, There remaineth, therefore, a day of rest for the people of God. Again, it's spoken of as another day. Another day besides the Sabbath, the Saturday, right? So there is another day of rest for the people of God. And so in the New Covenant, um, it, is, uh, it is on Sunday. We, we can see some hints of it. There's not more explicit references, but we do see hints of it, right, in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2, uh, also in Acts chapter 20, verse 7, where uh, they gathered together for prayer on the first day of the week, which for us would be Sunday, right? That's what we would say is the, the first day of the week. So, um, because our Lord then rose on the, f- the first day of the week, that is, the day after the Old Covenant Sabbath, which is Sunday, he has made on that day a new sacrifice to the Lord, as was predicted in Leviticus 23, verse 11, and as is uh, hinted at here in Hebrews chapter 4. So, um, that's important then to keep that day of Sunday not as a regular work day, Right? We keep that as a day of rest. That is, the, that is our new Sabbath. That is our new day of rest. So, we learned a few things, hopefully, tonight, huh? Uh, we learned a little bit about the uh, Gospel of St. John. We learned that he has seven signs. And again, signs are things that point to some other reality. And these seven signs that St. John put in his Gospel, these seven miracles that he chose to put, and only these seven... He only put seven miracles in his gospel. He chose these, it seems, to reference in some way to the new covenant signs, the new covenant outward signs instituted by Christ to give grace, the new covenant sacraments. Thankfully, we have uh, St. John's uh, lofty and beautiful gospel, uh, very good Uh, to meditate upon, um, especially in uh, these final weeks of Lent. Uh, Much of the readings are drawn from St. John's Gospel, so I encourage you to really enter into, take that time for personal prayer, uh, meditate upon maybe one or some of these miracles as we've described them, and there's more I could have said on them, but just for the shortness of time, I wasn't able to draw out all that was there, but that might be a good source of your, uh, your meditation. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, Please keep us in your prayers. Uh, Please keep our parish in your prayers. Please keep our uh, parish also in uh, in mind when you when it comes time for your tithing and whatnot. And we really appreciate all that you do, parishioners, for the parish.
May God bless you all. God bless.